in today's workshop, there's a couple of different topics I want to go over. First off, I'd kind of just like to talk a little bit about maybe the purpose of story or the function of it, because if you're anything like me, you probably want to do it well. Um, but in order to do it well, I think we have to ask ourselves, well, what does it do? And then we can take some elements from traditional um, kind of circular structure that we see across a lot of different um, story interpretations and see how that can benefit and aid our effectiveness. And then taking a little bit of a look here at character, what a character is made up of, plot, and the theme. So just a little bit about myself, I'll just say that um, since I was a young lad, uh, I've really just enjoyed creating things, typically with a video camcorder. Um, and I have a vivid memory of being out camping with my cousins. Uh, they stumbled upon the camcorder and they watched some videos that I had made. And I was at first very embarrassed because they were very odd. And, and, and then I saw the way that um, they laughed at them in a way that didn't feel demeaning, but um, felt like we were all part of something together. So before I jumped into it, I, I wasn't exactly sure how this was going to work. I wanted to see if um, anybody here in uh, attendance wanted to turn on their video, introduce themselves, and um, possibly either share what was the last memorable story that um, you saw or what facet of writing you are interested in, if any. So I don't know if there's interest in that, but I'd love to hear from you all. Um, so go ahead and, and, and jump on. Joel, can you hear me? Joel? I'm up here in the corner from my screen anyway. Okay, so uh, I have been writing a story for a long, long time. It is a film. It's an animated musical and animated live action musical because the live action is the secondary narrative which weaves through the animation narrative. And uh, so it's called the Microcosmic Cartoon Show. And that's my most interesting story because it is really the story continuing of my life as I learn what this cartoon is about. We live in the cartoon and it is a show and it is a microcosm. I think that's one of the things we'll touch on is uh how stories are um, such a beautiful way to learn about ourselves. And it sounds like um, you're coming to that in your own telling. So that's awesome. Um, somebody brought up a decent point, which we might not um, have that much time for everybody to jump in and say something, but um, I still encourage you to, um, if you just want to introduce yourself real quick. I'll go real quick. Um, Michael, I live in Tyride. Um and I took, I made a little bit of a, an example film about uh, Tyrite beavers. And um, it's actually this beaver pond here behind me. And um, I just want to learn how to make a, construct a storyline um, besides uh, about, about beavers and Tyrite and whatnot. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Nicole, thank you. All right, I won't pull any teeth here, so I'll just jump right into it. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen here. Please let me know um, with a nod or something if you can see what I'm showing. Okay, right on. Um, so as I touched on before, the first thing I wanted to talk about was uh, this power that story has. Um, and the first thing that comes to mind with story is um, it's very broad appeal. Uh, it spans back to our prehistory. Um, it spans across cultures. A particular text can resonate for thousands of years after it's written. Um, a film can do the same thing. And at the same time, we can have something come out um, tomorrow and it captures the zeitgeist in a way that um, is totally fresh 
and totally new. So it's this way to connect us over something that um, we kind of have this intrinsic DNA for almost stories are coded into us, it almost seems, uh, especially if you've ever um, spent time with kids reading them stories. Uh, there's something there that um, just sparks life into them. It's a really beautiful thing. And of course, as we see from the panel here, we have individuals across a variety of ages. And so it's very obvious that um, this is just such a powerful um, tool. And that's an important word to use. It is a tool. Um, we are able to communicate uh, our experience. We're talking about this unifying aspect of story. Well, there's also the very personal um, aspect of it. And that's what happens when we sit down with a book or a TV show or a film and we feel like the creator has created it almost exclusively for us. I've had that experience um, certainly many times where it just feels like, wow, they are communicating ideas to me about myself that I did not even know. Um, and so that's just a really beautiful way to be reminded that we're not alone. Other people feel how we feel. And then when we connect with others about these stories that are treasured to us, um, that just grows our connection and our ability to um, have community. So there is this emotional aspect that um, connects us to characters and, care, and we care about them. And there's also an intellectual aspect in which we um, invest ourselves in their stories and we really wanna find out what happens next. So it works on these two different spheres of the brain and because of that, I think is what makes it so effective. And that effectiveness comes into play in its ability to communicate um, an idea to us in a way that is emotionally resonant. We will come to talk about this as the theme, but for now I'll focus in on a couple of quotes here that I think are meaningful. So this first one here is life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. And that's sort of the ticket that we all have in our life. Um, but when we are watching a film or reading a book, we actually um, have this rare moment of uniting um, insight and emotion at the same time. The second quote here again shows maybe um, why story developed the way it did, which is that um, we can learn from other people. We can learn from characters who we look up to as heroes, and we can learn from tragic tales. We can see um, through the actions of what they did to influence our lives and help us make decisions. Joseph Campbell is gonna come up a few more times in today's discussion. He's a mythologist. Um, he wrote a very influential book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And he says here, it has always been the prime function of mythology and right to supply the symbols that carry the human spirit forward. So those symbols that carry the human spirit forward, it's um, a little abstract. Um, here's a maybe clearer way of thinking about it, which is that when we're telling a story we are creatively demonstrating the truth, and that is our interpretation of the truth. But again, we're still kind of working in, in, the, idea, in the idea realm, and let's try and get a little more concrete here. Um, ultimately, I think storytelling is problem solving. Uh, a story really is not a story until a problem is introduced. I can tell you that today I went to work, and I came home. That's not really a story. If I tell you I got into my car this morning, I turned the key and the engine turned over. Suddenly we have a story on our hands because I need to get somewhere and something is preventing me from doing that. The steps that the character, in this case me, takes to solve that problem shows you what kind of character that is, what kind of person that is. One person, when their car doesn't work in the morning, they call AAA. Another person bangs on the dash. Another person calls a friend. Another person breaks down crying. These are the moments that we begin to see who the character is when they are confronted with the world upending their plans. 
So a character wants something that they don't have or a character has something that they don't want. We're gonna take a couple examples of this in a second here. And kind of like what we said, it's the actions of the character that they take to resolve a problem that we see their true nature. And through the consequences of those actions, uh, the theme is revealed. So this is one of my favorite movies, Spider-Man 2. And right out of the gate here, um, Peter has a problem which he doesn't want to be Spider-Man anymore. So he has a solution, he takes an action, and he gives up his life as Spider-Man. We see through the consequences of that choice that Peter Parker's life improves, but um, the city's diminishes. We see an uptick in crime. We have this scene here where Peter is unable to save a kid in a burning building. And finally, we see um, the love interest, Mary Jane, taken by Dr. Octopus. So we have a new action, which is to redon the suit of Spider-Man and fight Dr. Octopus. Through that new action comes a new, com new outcome, which is that um, Spider-Man saves the city. So that's, of course, a very broad overview of the plot. But now we say, well, what is the truth there? What can we determine from the actions of Spider-Man and what happens because of them that the story is ultimately trying to convey to us? And that is that a hero is willing to sacrifice what he wants for what his people need. So that's when we talk about meaning, we talk about truth, we talk about theme, we're looking at something like that. We can jump in here to another one, Shrek. So Shrek's problem is that there's all these creatures who are in his swamp. His action is to agree to rescue a princess for Lord, Lord Farquaad in exchange for solitude. We see the consequence of that being that Shrek saves the princess um, and a new problem arises, which is that he comes to have feelings for her. We see that because um, he mishears what she says and he has a certain way of thinking about himself. Um, Shrek holds his end of the bargain up and brings her to Farquaad. That's his action. What happens because of that is, be is he is heartbroken and another new problem arises, which is he discovers he misinterpreted Fiona. He takes another action, which is he objects to Fiona and Farquaad's union and expresses his love in the process. Finally, at the end here, after he's expressed his love, Fiona also reveals her true self to Shrek. Shrek kisses Fiona in an action and we see that the curse is lifted, but she remains an ogre. Of course, Shrek, um, he knows what true love is, so he assures her that he still loves her and that she's a beautiful ogre. And so again, we have this truth, which is that true love is rewarded to our hero, Shrek, because he knows that true love is more than skin deep. So we're talking about the function of stories. We're talking about conveying truth, and we're talking about doing it through the actions of the character, um, demonstrating that. We're going to go with one more here, which is the movie Being John Malkovich. This one's going to be a little tricky if you haven't seen it, but just bear with me. So we have Craig, who is a puppeteer who can't find any work in that line of business. And he's fallen in love with Maxine, someone who he works with at his day job. He comes to find a tunnel that leads into the consciousness of actor John Malkovich. And the action he takes is to use the newfound power and the ability to control John Malkovich to win over Maxine and fulfill his puppeting dreams. A consequence and new problem of the action is that, again, the plot gets a little complicated. There's a sort of a cult who worship John Malkovich they kidnap Maxine and they tell Craig, you need to get out of Malkovich's body. 
So Malkovich, or sorry, Craig takes the action to exit Malkovich's body. But we run into a new problem in that Maxine has chosen to be with someone who she truly loves and not Craig. Craig returns to Malkovich, but instead of entering him, he enters the consciousness of the next vessel, which is Maxine's daughter, and he has no control. So the plot of that one, it's kind of, it goes around, but the theme here is very interesting, which is that this man can't find comfort in his own skin, and so he lives in this perpetual hell. So here we are back to talking about um, the big picture truth, theme, and meaning. Notice that in each instance, these are not one word answers. Um, we can say that there are topics of a certain piece, certainly. Spider-Man is heroism, there's love in there, there's family. But when we're talking about truth, we're talking about theme as this thing that encapsulates the story, we wanna have it specific and we wanna keep it to one idea. I find and um, so do many other um, story analysts that when we begin to cram too much into something, the potency of it actually um, decreases significantly. So we wanna keep our ideas focused and that's gonna lead to um, the most efficient display of them. What is the underlying message conveyed by characters action and their consequences? Really, that's what story is. We're not necessarily trying to make the audience think a certain way. We can't go 100% and give them everything. We don't like it when they do that. Uh, that is articulating the theme. What we want to do is demonstrate the theme. And this is a nice little point here, which is that I'm sure a lot of you have heard the adage to write what you know. And that can sometimes feel maybe hindersome, um, thinking, oh, I have to write about the particulars of my life. I want to write about, you know, a, a space opera, or, or I want to write about, you know, crawling into the consciousness of, a, of an actor. When we're talking about writing what you know, this is what we're referring to, is um, the theme and the meaning and the truth. And just from the two, um, two of you who shared with us today about the stories that you're working on, it reminds me that each person has such an individual and unique vision of not only story, but of the truth. And that's why it's extremely important um, that we're able to do this and we're able to express these things because um, who knows how much your story is going to mean to someone who sees it. Um, so I think this is a, a really important um, piece of the puzzle. And so that's why I spend some time on it here. We're going to go to this quote here by um, Robert McKee, which is meaning produces emotion. Again, this is kind of hitting on the same idea, which is that when a piece is really resonant with us, um, we are seeing a a change. And the way that we see that change is by a character um, trying something new. We see them trying something. We see them trying to get what they want in a way that um, shows underlying issues, old beliefs and fears through the course of the story. We're almost thinking that we're beating this person down until they can't believe what they used to believe anymore. So we are going to move on to character for a minute here um, and think about character in terms of wants and needs. We're talking about the action of a character revealing who they are and the consequence of the action revealing the theme or the rule of the universe. But when we think about what motivates the action, there are really two levels to it. And we want to think about it um, in a conscious way in an unconscious way. So in a conscious way, this is what the character wants, and this is what we as an audience can identify pretty easily throughout the piece. So Shrek wants to restore balance back to his swamp and get the fairy tale creatures to leave. 
Spider-Man wants to be with Mary Jane. John Malkovich wants to, or sorry, Craig wants to be a master puppeteer and be with Maxine. So this is an external uh, fulfillment. They think this is what will bring them to wholeness. And when, when we're talking about story, it's very, uh, it is um, on the intellectual side, it is on the emotional side, but it's also um, on the deeply spiritual or psychological side, depending on how you want to look at it. So I like this quote here by John Truby. He says, the need is what the character must fulfill within herself in order to have a better life. So going back, um, Shrek needed to learn in order to have a fuller, richer life, um, to love, to be loved, and to see love more than just on the surface, look a little deeper. Needs can reveal weaknesses in our character. And we'll come to see in a little bit that establishing, or maybe not establishing, but having weakness in our character and making sure that we as the storytellers know what that is, is of extreme importance. And we want to see that need on a moral and psychological level. So what that means is well, we'll just click ahead here, actually. Let's look at Shrek. So Shrek, like we said, he wants to return to the fairy tale. He wants to return the fairy tale creatures to their home and get his swamp back. That's his want. There is something unconscious, he's not aware of it, driving that behavior. And that's that he wants to prove to everyone else that he doesn't need anyone, that he can be alone and he's happy alone. So we think about that want, we think about that unconscious, unconscious drive, and then we think about the weakness that is implied from that conscious drive. So he needs to prove that he doesn't need anyone. Who, why do you have to prove that? Um, it speaks to an insecurity, um, and that would be the psychological way. So that is the hindrance in a psychological way that is keeping him from being who he can be. But then there's also a moral aspect to it. We want to think about how is this character's behavior also affecting others in a way that is damaging. And I put unpleasantness in here, which is um, maybe putting it a, li a bit lightly. He can be a bit of a jackass sometimes, as we've seen in Shrek. So we have this want to be alone, prove that he doesn't need anyone. But motivating underneath that is this insecurity um, and and lashing out um, at others in an unpleasant way, as if almost to prove what they say is true. So Shrek's need in the story is going to end up being to allow himself to love and to be loved. And when we think about the theme that we are extracting as audience goers, we can say that true love comes to us when we see someone for who they are and not what they are. So is that um, all meshing for everybody so far? Is there any questions? I know there's, we're going over a decent amount here. Okay, um, just hop on it at any time if, um, if you have one, or you can even do the raising your hand apparatus. So now let's talk a little bit about structure. Um, when I first came to looking at story structure, it was almost from a defeated point of view, which was that I could not seem to um, figure out how to actually make my story stand on two legs um, and walk on its own. It felt very disjointed. Um, I had a character or maybe even characters that, um, you know, I, I felt like I had grown well and I was interested in. I had a couple of scenes that, um, seemed humorous to me or, or inventive, but uh, there just didn't seem to be any cohesion. I wasn't sure where it was going. And, and so that's what led me to looking at story structure. Um, and keep in mind with everything that I say, I probably should have added this caveat at the beginning that these are my interpretations of other people's interpretations, and those are just their interpretations. So take what you like and leave the rest, of course. 
I like to see the story as a circle. Um, one, just because it's really easy to kind of jot down quickly and see where you're going on the fly. But also in a more metaphorical way, I believe it really um, speaks to the rhythm of life, which is, you know, we're circling the sun, the seasons change, the years go by, and there's constant motion and constant change that we are um, learning to adapt with. And at the same time, um, we're kind of circling the same things over and over again. And that's why you'll often hear that, oh, there's only one story or, you know, most stories can be bottled down into this one idea. And I think a large part of that is true. And I think a large part of beginning to understand it will give you the ability to do what you want with it and say, oh, I actually disagree with this here. And well, what would happen if I did this here? So let's just jump into this really quick. This is um, based on Joseph Campbell's uh, monomyth is what he called it. He studied a lot of myths across the um, different cultures and different times. And he came to this circular motion that in essence basically comes to a character who is, we'll say deficient in some way, needs something, um, whether it's him or the society and they are to descend into an unknown realm. They leave what is familiar. While they're there, they find what they're looking for. This can be represented in something physical. Um, you know, maybe it's um, a goblet or, um, you know, the Holy Grail. And then they return with it. But it's not necessarily the item itself that's important it's the deed it's what has been done so this this quote here um, is really helpful for me a hero ventures forth from the world of common day into supernatural wonder and if you see there that's this x fabulous forces are there encountered and a decisive victory is won that puts us at y the hero comes back from this mysterious venture with the power to restore boons on his fellow man. So we get this sense of a raising of consciousness, but the only way to get there is to descend. Campbell also talks about this as a death and a rebirth. We are giving up a certain way of life. We're giving up a certain way of thinking and acting in order to fill into a new role, a new role, and become something greater. And that's another thing that I find um, so beautiful about stories um, is that they provide a path or a template for change and they, and they show that change is constantly happening to us. And, um, you know, the hero confronts what is averse and what is difficult and they transcend it. Of course, there are stories where they don't, um, but I'm a big fan of the classic structure here. So we'll go a little bit more in depth. We'll start at the top here and we'll see where it says you. So this is where we establish our character, characters, we establish our world. We want to create uh, an equilibrium but we want to make sure that we are at least hinting that there is some rumbling beneath the surface. All may look well, but all is not well. And that's where we get to the need of the character. Um, and we talked about before, this might be acquiring something that um, they're desireful of, or it might be getting rid of something that they don't want. But what's important here is that this shakes the status quo of the story. When we think about this need here, we can take a look later on in the circle at the point of return. This need is sometimes called an inciting incident. So in the case of Shrek, this is the fairy tale creatures showing up at his swamp. Suddenly, the story is in a different direction than when we started. Shrek has a goal now. We as an audience are with 
we, we're with Shrek, if that makes sense. We're, we, we have the same goal. The beginning of the movie, we are being introduced to him. We are, trying, we are seeing how he um, handles problems. We are seeing what's important to him. And now suddenly the status quo is um, it's shaken. So he needs to go. And that's where we'll see the third point here. And if we look at this as a point of cross-cutting, Campbell calls this a threshold. And it's just an interesting um, idea to play with which is that if a hero is going to go on an adventure and be ready to change, um, that hero has to prove himself. And so an obstacle will be thrown at him. And so in this case, we see Shrek show up to Duloc to talk to Lord Farquaad. And there is a tournament of sorts, the winner of which will be rewarded with the opportunity to go save the princess and bring her back to Farquaad. So Shrek um, handles all of the other armed forces and he gets the quest. So again, we see this circle is constantly changing direction. And that's something that we want to think about with our story is that at every scene, maybe even every line of dialogue is changing the dynamic of the story on at least um, a small way. The last thing we want is stagnation in story because then our audience is gone. That's not to say we won't have periods of rest fall, you know, after these more intense um, climactic moments. It's just to keep us, just to remind us that we need this constant motion. And if we look at the line of the circle, it can just uh, help us remember, okay, so I've established my character, I've established my, my need here, um, but now we need to go in a different direction. What's gonna happen next that keeps the plot moving forward, but also in a different direction? So from there, we have the search. This is usually um, seen as trials of the hero. This is where uh, the hero must adapt to a new world. And as we can see, this is the first part of the circle that is on the lower threshold. And if we want to think about the top as the conscious, we want to think about the bottom as the unconscious life. We can think of the top as order. We can think of the bottom as chaos. I'm, I hope I've made this clear, which is that we have the hero's physical journey but ultimately this is a journey inward. Shrek needs to confront these parts of himself that are holding him back. Spider-Man needs to do the same. And so does Craig. If they are able to confront that part of themselves and assimilate it, um, they are the hero triumphant returned. And if they're not, then we get the st sad story of Craig who, um, who is not able to take the wisdom of the universe. Okay, up here, just another quote that's nice is the finest writing not only reveals true character, but arcs or changes that inner nature for better or worse over the course of the telling. Okay, we won't um, jump into there quite yet. Or actually that might just be fine. So we've kind of, we've been talking about um, the character's wants and needs, um, talking about how the theme as should be influencing um, the wants and the needs. And then we can see, I mean, we didn't really get into the specifics of it, but ideally what our plot is doing, we're thinking of it um, almost as this two hands wringing your, protagonist, um, trying to knock the old ways of life out of them. And the way that we do that is by continuing to show the futility of their old ways of behavior. So the old ways of solving a problem continues to bring them lower and lower and lower. So in the case of Shrek, um, we're talking about, um, the search, he goes across the bridge, 
He goes to the castle. He rescues Fiona. He finds her. It's this. Um, it's this nice. It's this nice moment. He cat. He brings her out, and the quest is done. And now again, here we are at Y. This is the decisive victory that's been won, and the journey is moving in another new direction because now we're going to see that Shrek is beginning to have feelings for Fiona. Uh, but that can't be because Shrek doesn't feel feelings. He's a lonely ogre, he's a monster, and he can't have that. So we see this wrestling of who he thinks he is and who he truly wants to be but won't acknowledge. We see Shrek at his lowest point. He's finally about to tell Fiona how he feels. He overhears her say something about being an ugly ogre. He takes it personally, of course, because everyone thinks he's an ugly ogre. He thinks he's an ugly ogre. And he makes the choice to um, turn his back, give her to Farquaad, and go back to the swamp. So I think it's worth thinking about when we watch stories and when we're writing stories is we know they're going to eventually get to a lowest point what brought them there? Um, what is the kind of behavior that brought them there? And for Shrek, it's sort of this self-sabotaging, pushing away unlovability. If we're having a problem figuring out what the need of our character is, we can think about their lowest point and the actions that brought them there. And that will usually give us a clear indication. So it is finally at his lowest point that Donkey reveals that this is not actually what was said. You misheard it. And Shrek goes to the wedding. He objects like we saw earlier. And he has harnessed this new power, which is to allow himself to be loved and to love other people. So we see him up here, old way, old life. He wants something. He wants to get back to his old life because it's been disrupted. He goes and he actually comes to find that he doesn't want that anymore. What he wants is to be with Fiona. So the want isn't always as important, or it's never as always, it's never as important as the need. Um, and in fact, a lot of the time, they're contradictory. So if we see Shrek's behavior here, what he wants to do is be alone. And that's because he's this big, ugly ogre and he doesn't want to be with anyone. But all of his actions show that he's actually a very kind hearted uh, man with a lot to give, a lot of love to give and a lot to be loved. When we create this inner conflict, let's, I'll go back to that inner conflict here that is the, that is really driving the story and it's hammering home the theme and we want our plot to um continue to do that we want to have it all kind of work together plot theme character and keeping in mind that a character is really inner conflict so this is a nice piece of advice um as we're kind of I guess on the on the wrapping up side here, um, the first is just a general piece of writer's block advice, which is to follow the fun. Jordan Peterson's not Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peele says that, um, and I think it's just a really good um, reminder that when something isn't working and we're kind of banging our heads against the wall, well, maybe we need to introduce something that really excites us and really gets us passionate about why we're doing this in the first place. And then there's a little bit of um, perspective advice here from Dan Harmon, which I really enjoy. He says, stop trying to prove you are a good writer to yourself. You're always going to think you should be better than you are. The only thing you'll be able to write right now is something worse than what you think you should be writing. It doesn't necessarily sound like a very promising and optimistic quote, but um, I've really settled on this and, and let it sink in. And it's so true that often our biggest inhibitions are our own expectations of ourselves. Um, 
we can't expect ourselves to get this all right at once. I know I certainly haven't. And I know fear is what keeps me from actually putting in the practice because that is how we're going to make new ground. Story structure, I think, is very helpful. And if this has um, been at all insightful for you, I have um, a list of some of the sources that I've found really helpful here at the end. But more than anything else is just sitting down and writing things out and allowing it to be what it is. If we think of our brain operating on two different, um, in two different ways, which is a rational intellectual and then more of an emotional creative side and these two things can't really be going together at once so if at all possible we can um, set some intention when we're writing which is i'm just going to write um, sometimes it's a matter of setting a 25 minute timer and just going not letting the brain kick in that says oh that's no good cross that out that doesn't work there because we'll have time for that later. What's most important when we're writing is to write, I think. And a lot of the structure stuff that we've been talking about is actually, uh, I think, very intuitive to us by nature. Uh, I think without realizing it, I'm sure a lot of you already were doing a lot of these things and knowing that this needed to be done in order to do what you wanted to do. So I do have um, some sources here for you. If you're interested, we've got about 12 minutes left. Um, so I don't know if anybody had a question or, or wanted reiteration, um, but there isn't too much that um, I have left. So if anyone has a question, they can type it into the Q&A or just unmute themselves and say it out loud. Um, Malik, I know you had asked about how one can inspire themselves to write and create film. I think the end of this might have answered your question, but if you have any follow-ups, you can put them in the Q&A. Um, while people are thinking, I might ask you a question. Um, so you talk about what brings a character to the low point. That can be something to, to use to identify if you've created a compelling character. Um, uh, it, it's like a clear indication of what the who the character is. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to ask, wh what's one way you know of, of coming up with a character flaw um, that you can use to then find that low point that they might experience throughout the course of a story? Um, I think it really depends on the type of story that you're trying to tell um, because I mean anything can be a character being a perfectionist could be a character flaw but it could also be something that's good being very studious um, so it's really hard to say and that's where it becomes really important to begin gestating on that theme and that character at the same time as well as we didn't really touch on this, but you probably have a premise for a night or for your story already. And weaving those in with the premise is just as important. Um, because uh, for example, um, I'm working on a story about um, some cats and there is a cat um, who is kind of um, resigned in life. They're grumpy and they're old. Um, and all I knew about the story was there is this old grumpy cat and that there was gonna be this kitten that enters the world, creates change, and then runs off. And I wanted the, um, the, the older cat um, to go after this one and bring it back in kind of a mythological way. And so we begin thinking like, okay, well, um, this is a story about a cat who is sort of seems like they've given up on life. So what are the flaws um, that might come up with that? Well. In the same way as Shrek, we could say there's an insecurity there. Maybe they thought, this cat thought that they were going to leave this um, really amazing life um, and they hadn't. And so these are, they're really embarrassed um, and there's a lot of um, self-hatred involved, maybe. Maybe it's an arrogance thing, thinking, oh, the world has nothing to show for me. Um, 
you know, I, I'm just going to sit here. Um, or, or maybe it's a, a thing of, of sloth and just being incredibly lazy. So I guess what I'm trying to say is going back to that idea that these things influence each other. Um, if you're not sure what your flaw should be, take a look at your premise. Um, take a look at your theme. Take a look at other attributes of the character and just say, like, what is really going to stop my character from getting what they want? <clears throat> that, that's helpful. Um, for you might have already touched on this, but for people that are sitting down to write for the first time, is there something that you could say to um, sort of help them uh, <clears throat> at least point them in a, a general direction to say, this is where you start. You touched on, you, you can't really be analyzing and writing at the same time. Um, but is there, do you, do you have anything to say on that? Um, I'll just read an exercise from this book that I was looking at that um, I thought was really insightful. Um, the first is to write down your wish list, a list of everything you would like to see up on the screen in a book or at the theater. It's what you are passionately interested in and it's what entertains you. The second exercise is to write a premise list. This is a list of every premise you've ever thought of. As you study these two lists, key patterns will start to emerge about what you love. This in the rawest form possible is your vision. It's who you are as a writer and as a human being on paper in front of you, go back to it often really like what you said there, Harrison. Um, you know, the, the first draft is always going to uh, have that quality of not being polished and not being perfect, but uh, word for word what you said, where it's, it's better to have it there um, imperfectly than to, you know, have some intangible, perfect script. I, I found it very helpful to just go in and write and let my first ideas out on the page. That's why I call it a vomit treatment. So, mm -hmm. and it's, it was very helpful. <clears throat> That's great. I, uh, I'm also a big fan of dreams. So if, if you write down your dreams um, and you, you take them seriously, I think you'll begin to also see patterns there. Um, sometimes upsetting ones, but uh, there's a lot in there. There's a lot of emotion in there and, and follow the emotion. <clears throat> I think journal entries are, are great too. Those can kind of go well with dreams, but is there, if there's something that you've been thinking a lot about either subconsciously or consciously and you make a note of it in your journal, um, I think my, for myself, I kind of leaf through my past journal entries um, and use them to figure out what I have been thinking about. Um, <clears throat> but also when I'm, when I'm in the process of writing, it can be kind of eye-opening to see what, I, what my mind is fixated on. And that can be something that I can use for inspiration uh, to build a story out of. I think that's a, a great point is just keeping in mind like, what is the obsession of my character? Um, your character is, is, is a little delusional, probably, probably a little neurotic thinking um, that one particular goal is going to fix them. And I know I've certainly been in that case in the real world too. Um, so yeah, just, just keep that in mind. Uh, carrying like a little book around with you throughout the day. Um, my friend would say something that I thought was... Um, quite salient, which was that he would, um, he, he said, I'm riding all day while I'm, you know, at work, working on bikes, I'm riding in my head and then I go home and then that's the time to, to knock it all out because I'll bet you we all have those ideas, um, you know, throughout the day that we think, oh, that's great. And then we let it go, which is fine. But what if we tried writing them down and then, you know, for an hour, we took our favorite one and just wrote where it see where it led. Uh, thanks, Joel, and thanks for you all. Thanks to you all for coming. Uh, we hope to see you at the next one. Uh, workshops are running 
through April 8th. The next workshop is finding about finding a subject for your film. And it'll be Thursday, February 18th at 11 a.m. Mountain Time. Um, and I will be the educator of that workshop. Uh, you can sign up for it on our Facebook at Paonia Film Festival. And you should also get an email, I think tomorrow, that will have the link there if you want to sign up for it. Thanks for coming to the first workshop. <laughs>